Back in the day, around the time George Washington crossed the Delaware, the French were being, you know, French, and Antoine Levoisier proposed a periodic table which contains light and heat as elements. The general consensus was that there were three states of matter. Heat up a solid, it melts, and you get a liquid. Heat up a liquid, it boils, and you get vapor. But what happens if you continue to heat up vapor? After one great pandemic, two world wars, and in the middle of a very cold one, scientists gradually came to accept plasma as the fourth state of matter. Today, plasmas are everywhere from our TVs, to fires, nuclear fusion reactors, and what scientists think constitutes 99% of our visible universe. Hi, we're group three, and while we could spend the rest of the day talking about how plasma revolutionized the world as we know it, Let's go back on track and talk about materials characterization. Our main story today is the ICPMS, or the inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry. So today, we're going to give a general overview of the ICPMS, then go into how it works, where it works and where it doesn't, and how you can use it in your research. So let's get started. As with every analysis technique, we first start off with a bubble chart of detection range against beam size. From the diagram, we see that the LA ICPMS technique offers a chemical sensitivity down to roughly 100 parts per billion and an analytical beam size of around 1 to 100 microns. Notice that this technique is for the LA or laser ablation ICPMS technique, which is used primarily on solids. For typical ICPMS measurements on liquids, the chemical sensitivity can go down to an astonishing order of parts per trillion (ppt), tracking down even a smidgen of impurities within the solution. However, in the case of liquids, the analytical beam size is effectively meaningless as elements can freely diffuse with little to no resistance within the liquid matrix. Hence, the ICPMS measurement techniques for liquids or bulks do not appear in the 2D bubble chart diagram, but can be seen on the 1D plot next to it. So one upside to the ICPMS technique is its ability to detect a wide range of elements. In theory, the ICPMS technique can measure up to 80 elements on the periodic table. However, if you visit the web page for ICPMS at CARA, you'll notice that the operators listed down a number of common elements such as hydrogen, halogens, and inert gases that cannot be detected by the machine. Upon inquiry, the operators explain that this is mainly due to 1. The ionization energies of light elements which are considerably higher than that of the argon plasma and 2. The ionization efficiencies of certain elements due to matrix effects, a topic that we'll get into in a later part of this discussion. So remember, if you are interested in analyzing samples containing these elements, it is recommended that you look for other analytical techniques. You have been warned. Now moving on, we take a closer look into the working principles of the ICPMS. First, you would of course need to adequately prepare your samples. Let's say you're into global warming and you want to study the composition of particulate matter in our atmosphere using the ICPMS technique. After collecting the specimen, you'd first need to dissolve the solid dust particles in strong acid alkali. This is because dissolved samples not only reduce the matrix effects, but also reduces blockage in the nebulizer, which brings us to the next stage of our machine. The nebulizer is the place where aerosolization of samples occur. A sample vial pumps the sample gas into the nebulizer, which is then mixed with argon gas to form an aerosol, i.e a suspension of liquid samples in an argon gas matrix. While traveling across the cooled spray chamber, larger aerosols are selectively removed by gravity and fine aerosols are introduced into hot plasma. This is necessary because plasma is inefficient at dissociating large droplets. So how is plasma formed? The plasma is formed at the end of a set of three concentric quartz tubes, collectively referred to as the torch. Argon gas flows through all three tubes. The inner tube is called the injector and contains the sample aerosol in a stream of argon which delivers the sample to the plasma. Concentric to this tube 
is a tangential flow of argon called auxiliary gas, which forms the plasma. The outer tube contains a flow of argon which serves as a cooling layer to prevent the torch from melting. And at the end of this torch is an induction coil which is supplied with radio frequency electric current. A high voltage discharge, also known as a Tesla spark, is applied to the flowing argon gas for a short time to introduce free electrons into the gas stream. As electrons travel back and forth due to a high alternating magnetic field from the induction coil, they ultimately collide with the argon gas, thereby causing ionization into argon plus ions. As the small sample aerosol droplets are pumped into the high temperature argon plasma, they are dried, decomposed, atomized, and finally ionized, producing a rich source of positively charged ions. The ions are extracted from the plasma into the interface through a 1 mm sampling orifice and then a 0.4 mm skimmer cone to a high vacuum region containing ion lenses and mass analyzer. Electrostatic lenses focus the ion beams by only selecting the positive ions into the reaction cell and removing the unwanted neutral species. Now we reach the mass analyzers, which all of you should be familiar with from our previous discussions about the SIMS analysis technique. Similar to SIMS, the quadrupole and magnetic sector mass analyzers are commonly used for ICPMS analysis. FYI, the ICPMS machine at CARA uses octupole mass analyzers that operate similarly to their quadrupole counterparts, only with higher sensitivity. So to briefly recap, for a quadrupole mass analyzer, an AC voltage is applied on top of a DC voltage for both the positive and negative poles. Based on the mass to charge ratio of ions, the positive poles filter out the lighter ions, while the negative poles filter out the heavy ions. By aptly adjusting the AC and DC components, we get to choose a mass of our interest, which is then sent to the ion detector. The ion detector works under the same exact principles as the electron detectors we learned previously in AES. To put it simply, the incident ion signal is amplified as it ricochets off a series of dynodes which multiplies the signal. The intensity of the resulting output current can thus be interpreted as the concentration of a specific ion in our sample. And of course, we wouldn't be touting the ICPMS with such high regard if not for its strengths in material analysis. For one, it's a fast technique that measures up to 30 elements per minute. It has a very low detection limit. It has a simple mass spectrum that allows qualitative analysis for each isotopes and it also allows the measurement of the isotopic ratio of elements. Nonetheless, as is the case with any other technique, the ICPMS also has its trade-offs. One of its most notable limitations is that the total dissolved solid should be limited to less than 0.2% to ensure that the spray chamber is not clogged by a large influx of aerosols. As a result, only a small fractions of samples can be introduced into the plasma. Then there's the issue of interference. Polyatomic interferences stem from two or more species which combine to give the same atomic mass of a substance that we are interested in. For example, an argon-40 cation from plasma would combine with a chlorine-35 anion from the solvent to interfere with the arsenic-75 signal within our sample. Thus, you can see why it is imperative for us to select an appropriate solvent to avoid polyatomic interferences. On the other hand, isobaric interferences arise when isotopes of two different elements overlap in mass, as can be seen in the diagram on the right. In this case, we would have to select other isobars for analysis. Finally, we have the matrix interference, which is a type of interference caused by dissolved concomitant salt ions within the solution. Remember how the sample plasma passes through two different orifices before entering the mass spectrometer? Turns out, dissolved salts have a tendency of depositing themselves on the cool tip of the sampling cone, leading to clogging. Due to the ensuing electrostatic force, our ion of interest diverts away from the central axis making it impossible to pass through the quadruple. As a result, the ion is wasted and the signal is reduced. 
Two ways to mitigate the matrix interference is by one, limiting the dissolved salt concentrations below a threshold of 100 ppm, and two, selectively measuring heavy elements with light concomitant elements. This is because when the element to be measured is heavy, such as uranium, and the element causing interference is light, the matrix interference is almost negligible. However, when the element causing the interference is heavy, and the element to be measured is light, the matrix interference is substantial. Now that you've acquired a solid foundation in ICPMS, we can take a look at some of its more recent applications. In a 2020 paper, Person and Co. demonstrated a high-resolution ICPMS technique that offers high sensitivity, high resolution, and straightforward analytical techniques. Visible in the diagram on your right, this technique easily circumvents the challenges of polyatomic interferences and also eliminates the need for charge exchange reagent gases, such as hydrogen or xenon, to resolve the peaks. This is particularly useful in the semiconductor industry, whereby detection of trace metal elements and acids used to clean silicon wafers is key for increasing semiconductor yields. Also, due to its robust matrix elemental analysis capabilities, the high-resolution ICPMS proves to be very useful in the battery industry. To elaborate, most of the aging parts and battery electrolytes are based on organic compounds. The conducting salt is based on lithium hexafluorophosphate. With HRICPMS, phosphorus could be detected quantitatively through the coupling of HRICPMS and chromatography system. It is advantageous as it provides a clean spectra to analyze the compound without any interference. Another interesting application is the combined laser ablation ICPMS and LIPS technique, which unlike any other conventional techniques such as FTIR or Raman spectroscopy, is able to measure polymer degradation and the uptake of inorganic species as a function of sample depth. Very briefly, a focused laser beam is fired onto the sample surface. With LIBS, the radiation emitted by the resultant plasma plume gives information about the major components of polymers, such as carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen, in addition to molecular information about the sample. On the other hand, the ablation laser causes sublimation of the sample surface. The ICPMS measures the aerosols generated in the process and returns information about concentration of inorganic components with sample depth. In other words, the variation of contaminant concentration with depth can be obtained. Now you can easily see why this technique is particularly attractive and shows huge promise in a variety of research fields. However, as you may infer, this technique provides a way around the shortcomings of typical ICP methods, which require the digestion of solids in the solvent prior to analysis. While this eliminates the risk of contamination or elemental loss associated with digestion. Do note that there are a number of caveats that do come with it, such as 1. The data is mostly qualitative, and 2. The depth resolution is mediocre at best. And with that, we conclude our presentation. Cheers if you were able to keep up, no worries if you couldn't. There's always the replay button. Thank you for your attention, and we'll be taking questions from the floor.